Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm going to be taking you through the next major variation in the Karo Khan. Of course, last week we went over the advanced variation. This week I wanted to cover the exchange. Of course, uh, these two uh, main lines are well named, if I can show you on the board here. The advance, of course, that we covered last week is when white advances the pawn forward in the exchange, as you might expect, is when you exchange the pawns on d5. And so this is a, a main variation of the Karo Khan that I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about with you tonight, uh, because there are some very testing variations in here. Uh, normally, when tension in the center is uh, decided like this so early on, it can lead to some slightly more boring positions where uh, each side isn't really getting into a, a huge battle in the center right away. But with this exchange, white uh, has his choice really of a few different lines, and all of them give black a problem to solve. So we're going to look to see what problems white can uh, pose to black and how black can go about solving them. So today, the first variation I wanted to cover uh, with you guys is this variation that starts with uh, bishop d3. Now, Bobby Fischer fans out there might know that this was one of his favorite lines uh, with bishop d3. And already, with bishop d3, white is kind of declaring how he wants to play the position and which problem he's giving black to solve. So of all of the black pieces, these two knights are going to have very natural squares. This bishop can easily come out to d6. Uh, what's the only piece that might have problems getting developed? Well, it's this bishop on c8. And so with bishop d3, uh, white takes control of this natural f5 square that this bishop might want to develop itself to and says, this is going to be your problem in the opening. How do you develop this bishop? And I'm going to suggest a line that uh, gets this bishop developed anyways, kind of just crams it in white's face regardless of what he wants to do. So uh, first and foremost, it's most natural to develop the knights first. So knight c6 is a pretty natural move, hitting this pawn. Uh, white will likely play c3. Now, uh, for those of you viewing, can any of you tell me why knight f3 isn't the most common move here? Why might white be avoiding knight f3 to, to defend this pawn? Um, There's a question for you guys at home in the YouTube chat here. Uh, knight f3 looks like a natural developing move. It certainly defends this pawn on d4, but, but what's the problem here? What's the problem here? Okay, there's a bit of a delay at home. I don't want to spend too much time. I'm sure the YouTube chat are, is full of geniuses who already know. Of course, this isn't in line with white's opening play so far. So far, white played bishop d3, and the purpose was we wanted to make it difficult for black to develop the bishop. And yeah, everybody has it now. Uh, with knight f3, you're simply giving black this g4 square now, so it doesn't make quite so much sense to uh, allow black to develop like this, which is why we see this slightly less natural c3, just defending this d4 pawn, keeping an eye on this g4 square as well. Now, there are two main lines here for black. Uh, the older main line is queen c7, and queen c7 kind of adopts the same approach that white adopted with bishop d3. Queen c7 is simply guarding this f4 square, preventing this bishop from coming here. And this is a perfectly acceptable way of playing, but I'm actually going to recommend the other line, which goes with knight f6. Now, of course, knight f6 uh, can allow bishop f4, and we'll certainly talk about what happens if white chooses to play there. But it does one more very, very important thing, and that is it controls the g4 square. So now, if white wants to stick to his guns, stick to preventing this bishop from getting developed, he's going to have to play h3 on this turn. And this is the main variation that I wanted to cover here today. Um, of course, bishop f4 is a perfectly playable move, and it does take advantage of the fact that white did not play queen, or black did not play queen c7. Of course, though, now after knight f6 and bishop f4, black has this opportunity to play bishop g4, and from what I've found, black really doesn't have any problems in this uh, variation. Uh, just to show you a line, queen b3 is by far the most popular response. Uh, that hits b7, so a common way to play is simply queen c8, defending this pawn and uh, supporting this bishop a little bit. 
Now white gets developed with knight d2. Uh, black gets developed with e6. You might see knight gf3. A simple bishop e7. Note, this is another downside to allowing this bishop to f4. Our bishop has to kind of settle for the e7 square rather than the d6 square. Uh, castles, castles. Rook e1 is very common for white. And now bishop h5 kind of reveals the, uh, the purpose of this bishop here. Uh, black gets it out to g4. But on g4, it doesn't really look that impressive. It attacks this knight, which isn't even pinned. This knight wants to move to e5 anyways. But black is going to drop this bishop back to g6 and trade it off for white's light squared bishop. And with this exchange, black uh, is really not going to be any worse at all. Just to show you uh, one example game here, uh, we'll see how this uh, game continued with knight e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes, and after bishop g6, they simply exchanged. White played h3, black got this queen to a better square, and they exchanged some pieces and agreed to a draw eventually. So open h file is both uh, a strength and a weakness with black putting some pressure here, but uh, e6 is the really only, only the o is really the only weak spot in black's camp, and his pieces all have good squares. And so this game was agreed to a draw. I will just flip through it very very quickly. Uh, black opened the h-file like this, uh, kept an eye on this e6 pawn, and after some controversy, the, the game was agreed to a draw uh, in this position. Um, so, no real problems for black, is the point of what I was saying here. Uh, with that in mind, I do think the more testing variation is not bishop f4, allowing black to get this bishop developed. I think the slightly more testing variation is actually with h3. Uh, and it seems to violate some opening principles uh, to move so many pawns like this so early on, but white is really sticking to his guns here and saying, you're going to have a tough time developing the bishop. Now, does anybody uh, at home already know this idea, I wonder? If, if you've got it in mind, um, why does it show 0-1 if they agree to a draw? That was a, a sideline. I was showing what happens at bishop f4. We're looking now at the main move, h3, in this game. Um, if you at home have any ideas on how we can get this bishop developed, please share it now. Uh, the answer is about to be revealed to you. Uh, it might be a sensible uh, time to simply give up and just develop the dark squared bishop. The move e5 is really common here, but this isn't actually what I'm going to recommend. It's a perfectly fine way of playing, but I like the slightly more combative g6 instead. Now after knight f3, we'll develop this bishop out to g7. White will get castled. And then, you guessed it, we're actually still going to develop our bishop out to f5. So this is my proposed solution to the problem that white posed us with this opening. Black's problem in this opening was, how do I develop the bishop? And this is the solution I'm recommending. You play g6, you fianchetto, and you bring this bishop out to f5. Now, uh, for example, if white ignores this bishop out here on f5, we can simply go for a trade on d3. And it's much like the uh, previous line I looked at, where black trades off uh, his bad bishop, quote unquote, for white's best minor piece, this bishop on d3. And he really shouldn't have too many problems. Just for an example line, this is uh, from a game of Alexeyev against Turov. Uh, it was a rapid game, I believe, but it's a, a little beside the point. Just to show you some moves. Um, the game can often continue like this. And. After a move like e6, you see black structure is very, very solid. Common ideas are you're just going to bring this knight into c4 uh, after a move like rook c8, for example. And really, there's, there's nothing to play for with white. With black, however, if you, you still want to try to play for a win, you can consider things like going for a minority type of attack after you improve this knight, things like that. There's definitely still stuff to play for here. Um, other than that, of course, the testing variation is to actually snap this bishop off the board with bishop takes f5. Uh, this, of course, fractures the black pawn structure, and you end up with this kind of funny looking structure uh, in the center for black. Now, the upside to this is you really gain a stronghold square on the e4 point. Uh, if, you if you drop a knight into the e4 square, the, really the only way white will be able to kick it out 
is with the move f3. And f3 isn't so much a move that uh, white really wants to play. It very much weakens the remainder of these dark squares around the king, and it kicks the knight back to d6, where it's not really a bad square at all. It can even eye the c4 square, or back to the e4 square if need be. So you gain this e4 point. This is the big upside. Of course, the downside is the king's side feels a little bit loose, a little bit weak. This h-pawn is isolated, and these pawns are, of course, doubled. So white is going to look to make use of that, that weakness now, but we didn't uh, give it away for nothing. For one, we got our bishop developed, and for two, we gained this really strong point on e6. So bishop f4 is the most natural way for white to develop. Uh, I'm going to recommend castles for black. And now knight e5, uh, white points out that we have the e4 square, but he still has the e5 square. Now simply e6 makes a lot of sense to defend the rest of our pawns. Now knight d2, and knight e7. This is a fairly common maneuver here for black, bringing the knight over to the king side to guard some squares and force this bishop to a slightly less comfortable spot than a f4. Uh, the game continued with rook e1. Now knight g6 does come on the board, and this bishop drops back to h2. Uh, of course, we are eventually going to make use of this e4 square, and white chose to do so, or black chose to do so now, with knight to e4, and now knight d3 comes on the board, and uh, we simply continue improving our pieces as we do in, in most variations of chess. Uh, I would say the opening is more or less complete now, and we're, we're solidly in the middle game. Um, as for where we kind of stand in this middle game position, it's all about this e4 square. This knight on e4 is a really, really powerful piece, and it's going to be tough to dislodge without playing f3. So white is eventually probably going to commit to this move. In the meantime, black can do a lot of useful things. For example, this bishop isn't its brightest on the g7 square, so in the game, black had developed it out to h6, and now it's, it's looking a lot, of, at a lot of uncomfortable squares. And the reason I like this so much for black is the pieces all seem to have a purpose. They seem to work together, and uh, it is actually black who is stronger in the center. Now, the game can go a lot of ways from here, uh, but just to show you how this game developed, white went for knight f3, aiming for this e5 square, and black now, with the benefit of having these double pawns, can guard both the f6 uh, both the e5 square and the e4 square with f6 and f5. So f6 comes on the board to stop any knight e5 business. Now white tries to get at this weakness a little bit. b6 is a pretty nice move by black, just stops uh, the white knight from ever coming into c5. Queen b3 was white's choice. Rook c8 makes sense to guard c4. King h1 came on the board. Queen d7 guards some weaknesses. Now rook a e1 to get at e6, king h8, knight g1. Um, the unfortunate truth for white is that the black pieces are well placed enough that knight g1 is the only way to get this knight out of the way to play f3. Now we saw rook e8 to simply guard this pawn, f3. Uh, black actually chose the d2 square, hitting this queen, queen d1, knight c4. And now uh, in the game, white found nothing better than to actually play f4. Uh, perhaps he could have tried something like g4, but uh, I really don't believe it so much for white. If he does play like this, well, he might get hit with the move f4 by black himself when black is looking to plant this knight onto e3. So that's why f4 was chosen, largely to prevent f4 from black. But now, of course, this once again gives up the e4 square. And after knight f3, knight e4, uh, I can't imagine a world where uh, black ever loses, loses this game with this strong central knight compared to these, these shattered white pieces. Uh, black did end up going on to win, actually, and I will show it quickly. g4 was played, f takes, h takes, and now eventually uh, black expands on the queen side a little bit, uh, comes up with this move, f5. It's a nice move to keep this bishop uh, a little bit hemmed in. g takes f5, e takes f5. And we see the stronghold on e4 persisted up until white broke and captured, giving black this nice passed pawn. Uh, knight g5 was white's choice, rook f6. And bishop back to h6. Now this knight kind of invades. 
queen d5 is a very nice move, pressuring this white king. Uh, rook e3, but now knight f3, and rook g6, rook takes, h takes, a3, king g7, bishop g3, uh, b5 from black, knight g1, and then uh, I'll let you at home try and find black's next move. It's a, it's a pretty fun one. Takes advantage of some pins, and uh, it's a great way to reroute the knight. Um, I did kind of blow through this middle game, but uh, I wanted to largely focus on the opening. And we saw that uh, it was a lot of maneuvering in the middle game, but it's all about this e4 square in the end. That was kind of the point, while you think about black's next move here. See if you can find it. See if you can find it. Okay, bishop takes f4 has been suggested, which is ambitious, but it does lose a piece. You get a check, but I'm not sure it's quite enough here. You're not quite checkmating me just yet. Not quite checkmating me. Yeah, Akarsh has it. It's, of course, knight e5. When this pawn is pinned, and this pawn is pinned, and this knight's coming in to, uh, to g4. A pretty nasty move here. Uh, queen f1 was white's choice. Now rook h8 makes a threat. So king g2, and now knight g4. And this king really doesn't have any squares. Uh, rook e1 was played, and black actually brought the rook back over to c8. And king g8. Black really took his time in this game, but he was winning kind of throughout from, from this point onwards. Eventually e3 came on the board, and black got at this king. And here white ended up uh, actually resigning. So... Of course, white didn't play perfectly this game. The point was, when you get this e4 stronghold, uh, the point was, this is kind of what the, the, the game revolves around. Black having this e4 strong point, and white trying to kick this knight out of the way, but then black's pieces are already so active that uh, white doesn't have a ton that he can really do about it. That's why I like this line so much. Black really takes the initiative, plants the knight on e4, and forces white to come up with ideas. Um, so that's all I have on this line of the exchange with bishop d3. Of course, this is uh, kind of the favorite of Bobby Fischer. Just to recap, the point of bishop d3 is to take away these squares from the bishop, and so, of all the lines I covered, the point is we're trying to solve this bishop on c8. With knight f6, we're threatening to bring it out to g4. After h3 prevents that, we play g6 to bring it out to f5. And in this main variation, we get this fun structure in the center where we have this nice e4 control. In all the other variations, we wind up trading this bishop off for this bishop on d3. And with these pieces off the board, it becomes a lot more difficult to uh, pressure black with the white pieces. Um, okay. I think we're just about ready to move on. And go with uh, this game between the one and only Vasily Ivanchuk and Evgeny Niger. Uh, of course, we are looking at the exchange Karakhan. This is the starting position. And last game, we took a look at some various lines involving bishop d3. This game, I wanted to test you guys out on perhaps the most testing variation, or at least introduce it, with c4. And this is what our uh, final two games of the day are going to be in here. This uh, Panov attack with c4. So, in the previous variation, the problem for black was this bishop on c8, trying to get it developed. In this variation, white takes a slightly more aggressive approach, trying than simply hamper, uh, trying rather than simply hampering black's development. White is going to go after this central pawn on d5, uh, just attacking it directly and asking black, how are you going to uh, defend this point? And in this game, I'm going to recommend a line which might not be popular with the viewers. It is, of course, the infamous endgame line in the Karakhan. So these first developing moves are pretty much the only ways uh, uh, white and black both play. Uh, and then after knight f3, this is white kind of saying he's, he's prepared to go into this endgame line. The other choice is bishop g5, which we're going to take a look at in the next game. 
But for this game, knight f3. And here, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I think the best line for black is honestly to go into this endgame line. You can do other things. Here, for example, if you want to avoid the endgame line entirely, uh, this g6 line isn't bad for black at all. Uh, the game might continue with something like queen b3, bishop g7, you give up this pawn for a moment and get castled. And these lines are a lot of fun, but uh, I, I think the end game line is, is simply solid for black, and black should be doing absolutely fine. So that's the line I'm going to recommend. If you're interested at home, though, you can take a look at these g6 lines. They're not so bad. But, okay, I'm recommending knight c6 when after knight f3, bishop g4 uh, is accepting the end game line variation. The line continues in a pretty forcing manner. White takes on d5. Black, of course, recaptures. Now white plays this move, queen b3. This knight is hanging. Uh, black takes this moment, though, to play the nice move. Bishop takes f3, taking off this knight and guarding this knight back here on d5. Uh, white has to recapture. Now this knight is still hanging, so the move is e6 to defend it. But of course, white can take on b7. Now this hangs the d4 pawn, so black will take. Now bishop b5 check is the point of white's play. We have to take this back. Then of course, white is not going to play it. Queen takes b5. Rather, uh, including this move, queen c6 check. And this is kind of the point. Uh, misplacing black's king ever so slightly by giving this check, forcing it up to e7. Now white can capture this knight. We will play queen d7 in response, offering a trade. Knight takes d5, queen takes d5, queen takes d5, e takes d5, and we have arrived at the main starting position of our endgame line. Uh... <laughs> Didn't he lose to Caleb? He did lose to Caleb uh, in response to the Bring Jonathan Trance back comment. Uh, just to briefly go over what just happened again. So white was putting a lot of pressure here. We just developed naturally and then white cashes in on d5. We take a moment to fracture white's pawn structure, but give up our b7 pawn in exchange for the d4 pawn. Then white develops with check, and white gets to prevent black from castling, and then we eventually see the trade of the queens. And that's how we arrive at this uh, quote-unquote starting position of the end game line. Uh, and of course, the line is appropriately named. We are in an end game. And there's actually a few ways that this endgame can go. Uh, I don't want to go too super in-depth into an endgame in this openings class. So for this line, uh, for today, we're going to just take a look at the line that was played in the game with bishop e3. I will briefly mention white uh, also sometimes castles. White also sometimes plays bishop f4. But in response to all of these moves, black is going to play king e6. This is the move for black. You develop your king and get it out of the way of this bishop, which is likely going to go to the b4 square. Uh, white can now really castle in either direction. In the game, he chose castle's queen side. If, for example, castle's king side, uh, black now really has a choice of developing to e7 and b4. I'm going to recommend developing out to b4, just for consistency's sake. You want to keep an eye on this file to uh, keep your king a little bit safer. In the game, queenside castles was played, and now bishop b4 is really the main move. Once again, just keeping an eye on the e1 square. Uh, rook d3 is what white chose in the game, trying to go after this pawn a little bit. Uh, black now activates the rooks immediately with rook hc8 check. This king steps over to b1, and then white, uh, black tries to solve the rest of his problems with this move, uh, bishop c5. And this is going to be perfectly fine for black. Really not, not much else to say. Uh, really, the only way that white can get an advantage in this line is if he manages to pressure uh, D, the d5 pawn rather early on. But he really doesn't get a chance to if black plays as actively as this. Uh, for example, the move rook c1 was played in this game. And simply bishop takes e3, f takes e3, and g5 and not even time to, uh, to pressure this pawn. So this is very clearly a draw, and we'll see in the game the players got there rather quickly. Rook a3, they traded off one set of rooks, a5 now, king over to d1, rook b8 offers to trade this pawn for this pawn. Uh, white, of course, wants to decline this, so the black rook doesn't get super active. So b3 is played, 
and now rook b5, rook a4, and h5, king e1, and f5, h3, king d6, king e2, and black takes this opportunity to simply repeat, as does white, as the players have kind of reached a bit of a standstill here with uh, the position. Uh, white could bring this king up to d4, but it doesn't actually achieve anything. Uh, white could kind of try to, uh, you know, it, escape with this rook, sorry, was struggling to find the, world, find the word, escape with this rook back to the d2 square. But once again, it, it really isn't making any, any kind of progress. Uh, if black wants to try something, he could try like king e5, but as soon as the king steps to the square, he might get met with f4 check. And now, there's simply no way to create a passed pawn for either side, and as such, there's not really any winning chances. Uh, so this game was agreed to a draw. Uh, and once again, just the key points of this variation. Um, this is, of course, the end game line. Uh, the other line we're going to look at is bishop g5. The key points are knight f3, you want to meet with bishop g4, which is getting your pieces developed. White cashes in on d5, black cashes in on f3, defending the knight for a moment. And now uh, white's pawns get fractured, but this queen invades, and we end up in the starting position. And that's really all there is to this line. As for things you have to remember, uh, e6 is almost, almost always the square you want to put this king on. B4 is always the square you want to put this bishop on to support the king on e6 by guarding e1. And then it's just a matter of getting your pieces into the game, getting them active, and making sure you keep track of your pawns. And that's about all I have to say about the end game line. If white castles right away before playing bishop e3 and black still plays king e6, isn't it scary with the king in the middle with open file with the rails? Let's take a look. So. If white castles king side here, and you still play king e6, isn't it scary? Well, you do get checked, but your king can actually step up to f5, and it's not at all unhappy about this. Um, here, the game might continue with something like uh, bishop e3, when you could once again just simply play bishop b4, or white might actually just uh, move the rook back over to, uh, to d1 here when you could play either rook d8 or even king back to e6. Both are perfectly reasonable moves. Um, so it's, it's really nothing more than a check. And if white ever tries to get fancy and tries to check you, you can always meet it with f6, just guarding this square. And the fact that these pawns are so fractured is, is really working in black's favor here. No way to get at this king on this nice, solid, light square. Uh, okay. You can draw as black if you know 30 book moves. You don't even have to know 30, honestly. Uh, and all of the moves are pretty natural. It's not like it's a lot of memorization. It's a pretty linear line. White takes you, you take back. White stops defending this knight, you take it. Your knight's attacked, you defend it. He takes your pawn, you take his pawn. You get checked. Ah, I don't want to be in check. Better take the bishop. I'll got him in check. Gotta move my king. Then you offer a queen trade, and you're here. You've made it to the end game line. And here, it's not so much memorization, you just want to put this king on e6 and this bishop on b4 and get your rooks into the game uh, as quickly as possible, without hanging any pawns. That's really all you need to know. Uh, okay, so that's all I have for this game. Let's take a look at our third game of the day between Levon Aronian and Daniel Stellwagen. Uh, this game, of course, is in, in the exchange Karo Khan. And we're looking uh, once again at this Panov attack with c4. In this case, knight f6, knight c3, knight c6. Last game, we took a look at the end game line with knight f3. Here, I wanted to introduce you guys to the slightly more fun line for both sides, bishop g5. Uh, this is putting a lot more pressure on the black position uh, rather than just the simple knight f3. Uh, of course, now there's no knight that we're hitting on f3, so it'd be a bit silly to continue with bishop g4. Now, uh, even a move like queen b3 uh, wouldn't be good, because we would hang this pawn. Don't want to forget that. But uh, a move like bishop b2 is, is perfectly fine for white or even queen a4. Uh, bishop g4 is not an awful move by any means, but it just doesn't make as much sense here with white playing bishop g5 rather than uh, knight f3. 
Uh, now there's a couple ways that black can play here. Perhaps even the most, uh, the more respected line is with bishop e6. The point is, you just kind of defend this strong point on e6, and due to the way that white has developed, there's no chance of a knight g5 kicking this bishop out. Uh, and this is a perfectly fine way of playing if you want to play like this. Uh, I'm not going to say you, you can't play like this line. Uh, the play might continue with something like uh, knight f3. This knight can jump into e4. And now after knight takes e4, d takes e4, d5, some pieces are going to get traded. Fork, so queen d2, uh, queen e5 check, queen e3, uh, queen a5 check. This is a well-known draw. And uh, there are just some, some piece trades line like this, lines like this that you have to be okay with. Uh, this is not what I'm going to recommend, though. I'm going to recommend the slightly uh, more risky d takes c4. And the point here is that uh, we're allowing white to push in the center if he so desires. Uh, and we're going to take a look at that line briefly, but I wanted to take a look at the most common line uh, as the main variation in this game. The most common line, of course, being bishop takes c4. So bishop takes c4 is a pretty testing line. It simply recaptures the pawn. And now the danger for black is if you fall into this kind of trap, I, I don't know if I can call it a trap because black isn't losing after he takes, but it, it is kind of uncomfortable af after you take immediately. Uh, well, the point is, black can get into some danger here if he doesn't know what he's doing. And it's going to be pretty similar to the lines we're going to look at in the game. Um, important to play first, I think, is this move h6. This uh, gains some time against this bishop out here on g5, uh, and it's just a good move to include. So bishop h4, and now I'm going to recommend that black takes this pawn on d4. And this gets you into some pretty forcing stuff that you have to be a, a little bit careful with. So queen takes d4, knight takes d4, and queenside castles is really the only way to play. And here, the danger is, if you play kind of a nonchalant move like knight c6, well knight b5 is simply uh, almost checkmate and certainly winning the game. There's no good response to this move if you, you play something like knight, e, knight c6. So now the only real move for black is to play e5, supporting this knight on d4. Uh, now I hear you asking, well, uh, what if we try to remove that defender for uh, black? And so there's a couple ways to do that. I'm going to look uh, first at this most testing move with f4, and then we're going to go back to the game where Levon Aronian actually simply just played uh, knight f3. So let's start with f4, though. Uh, f4 hits this pawn on e5, and I'll turn it over to the YouTube chat. See if you can find a way to solve this problem of f4. Some method of getting your pieces out such that you're not losing to knight b5. See if you can do it. How can we solve this problem of the knight on d4 and this pressure on e5? What can be done here? Play bishop g4 and hit the rook? Yeah, that's certainly uh, a good start. So bishop g4 is the move, but of course now uh, white has a really only only one main option. If you play the move rook d2, trying to be insistent on this idea with rook d8, uh, you're going to get met with rook c8 when there's too much pressure on this c file with this king lined up for these ideas to really work. Now if you move this bishop out of the way, for example, uh, the move knight e4 is going to come with pretty devastating effect. So bishop g4 is in fact the way to go, and white's going to have to respond with knight f3 now. You can imagine bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and then we still have to solve this problem, so rook c8 is the way to do it here. So bishop g4 and rook c8 is kind of the maneuver that you, you need to know going into this line. Otherwise, you're going to have to find it over the board, and you're probably going to be terrified while doing it. Just a little personal history. I myself fell into this line at some point before I really knew about it and was just kind of playing these moves and hoping for the best. 
and uh, I ended up losing that game horribly. So know your stuff, just play bishop g4 and rook c8, and then you are pretty much in the clear. There's a couple ways to play now with white. Uh, we, there's f takes e5, which hits this knight on f6, and you end up with some peace trades uh, in this manner, but this line isn't really testing at all. The other way to play is bishop f1, uh, trying to renew the threat uh, to e5 and to here. But now, black can play the nice move, knight d5, going after this knight on c3. Uh, the game could continue, f takes e5, knight takes c3, b takes c3, and bishop a3 check. This is a really nice developing move. King b1, knight takes f3, uh, bishop h3 hits this rook. Uh, of course, you can't leave the back rank, don't want to fall for checkmate. So rook a8 has to be played. Now bishop g7 check. This king comes to f8. And eventually, uh, black is going to get developed and have a perfectly fine end game. Uh, for example, in this game, it continued with rook d7. Uh, by the way, I'm in a, a massive side variation here. This is uh, Parlegras against uh, Mastrovasilis. Mastrovasilis with black here just in case you're wondering. And so this game continued like this, and they reached this end game, which is just totally a draw. Now, in this game, black actually managed to lose this end game, but that's beside the point. This end game's perfectly fine for black. White should have no pressure at all here um, once black gets developed. So that was this line with f4. Now, uh, we talked about a lot there. Key points to remember, against f4, you want bishop g4 hitting the rook, you want to trade on f3, and you want to play rook c8. And then the, the pressure kind of alleviates a little bit. Uh, against f takes e5, you just trade by taking uh, c4. And against bishop uh, f1, you have this nice move, knight d5, to uh, put pressure on this knight before anything nasty happens to your king. So key points to remember there. Now, in the main variation, after e5, uh, Levon Aronian actually played knight f3 in this game, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we are going to play knight takes f3 in response, doubling white's pawns. Uh, white actually inserts bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and now bishop b5 check. And for the second time today, we are met with a check on uh, this diagonal that we cannot really block. So king e7, once again, is the way to go. Uh, this happens more often than you might like in Karo Khan, but it's, it's the lay of the land. It's, it's what you got to do sometimes. And now knight d5 check looks absolutely terrifying. If you step up to a square like e6, you get met with knight c7 check. Could feel a little bit bad, but fortunately for us, uh, king d8 is actually the best move. Now, if you go in for this check a bit too early, we have knight d4 saving our piece, so we're perfectly happy here. Uh, so white takes the time to recapture. And then the nice developing move, bishop d6, is what is kind of holding this position together for black. Uh, now there's a few ways to play. Uh, white chose rook d2, uh, doubling up the rooks, and now after bishop c5, knight b6 once again is a check and is in fact winning the exchange, but in this case, uh, black simply has far too much compensation here, and uh, if anything, I think I would honestly prefer to be the black pieces here with these two powerful bishops uh, in this game. The game continued with bishop d7, black takes on a2, uh, getting another pawn, now bishop g4, and bishop d4 is a really nice move, just totally cuts off these rooks, eliminates their, their power almost entirely, and black has nothing to fear. After f4, uh, the players actually agreed to a draw, but I think black actually does stand uh, a bit better in this variation here. I think black is doing quite, quite well, actually. Uh, so certainly, a type of position they could have played on. For example, a move like bishop d5 is reasonable, and it's pretty simple to play with black, actually. You can just start pushing these guys up the board, and white is going to have some serious problems to have to solve with these strong, strong bishops in the center. Uh, okay. So, that was this variation with knight f3. You get checked, and you have to look out a little bit. There's this bishop d6, and then uh, knight b6 wins the exchange. Note that... Uh, a lot of these moves are actually pretty pretty forced, so you do have to know a little bit what a little bit about what you're doing here. So knight f3, you really do want to take this knight on f3. It's the only way to solve all these problems. 
Now bishop takes f6. You do want to take this back, of course. This check, king e7 is the only move. This check, king d8 really is the only move. And then bishop d6 is very much the, the only thing to play here. But from there, it's fairly natural chess. Rook d2, you play bishop b6, getting developed. You play bishop c5. And now if white tries to just like hold the tension or something with like f4, well, the point of bishop c5 is this bishop's going to sink on the f4 square. This is kind of the point of black's play. So just remember, uh, you have to remember these few specific moves. Knight takes f3, and then king e7 and king d8, and bishop d6 are important to remember. And then once white kind of goes about his business, you want to plant this bishop on the strong d4 square to force white's hand. Once this bishop lands on d4, black is almost always just doing perfectly, perfectly fine. So this is the idea with bishop c5 to remember. Why draw? Well, Levon Oronian is a very scary opponent, and I've never heard of Daniel Stelwagen. I'm sure he's a great chess player, but with black against Levon Oronian, sometimes you're just happy to take a draw. can hardly blame the guy. Um, okay. So, yeah, I did skip over the last critical variation that I want to cover for the day. So we've covered pretty much uh, all of the exchange, and now I want to talk about the last kind of big hurdle to overcome in this pan of attack. D5 in this variation does uh, pose some other problems to black. So D5 is not recapturing this pawn, on c4, but it is taking a lot of central space, and you have to be ready to meet this move. I'm going to recommend the line that goes with uh, knight e5, um, and from here, sorry, one moment, don't know why it flipped, okay, knight e5, and from here, black can actually, uh, sorry, white can actually simply recapture this pawn on c4, and the line can continue with knight takes c4, queen a4 check is white's point, regaining the piece, bishop d7, queen takes c4. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the more testing lines. Uh, it's not actually the main line of this variation, we'll go back and see that as well. Uh, but I think this, this line g does give black some problems if he's not careful. I'm going to recommend the move h6, and I wanted to briefly stop and say this h6 move is almost, almost always a good inclusion for black. We saw it in the previous line. You wanted to play h6 before you took on d4. It, it's the case in this line as well. h6 is a really nice move for black to start shaking loose this bishop from g5 and give the black pieces some more freedom. In this game, bishop uh, h4 was played, and black actually continues expanding with g5. And bishop g7 is how white or black solved this problem of the d5 pawn kind of cramping his position. He got developed in this manner. And I think this is uh, honestly the way to go. Note that if white takes on f6, we're happy to take back with the e pawn when our bishop now has a very, very natural square on, on d6 to uh, jump into. Okay, stepping back, rather than bishop takes c4, the main move here is in fact queen d4. And once again, this is the move h6. This is the way you want to play. Now, queen takes e5 doesn't really give you any problems. You simply take the bishop back. And if uh, white wants to try and take a pawn here, he's going to get met with b5 and a rude awakening that the c4 pawn is not going to remain up for grabs. In fact, black is holding this pawn forever and ever and ever. And moves like rook h5 are also going to be rather annoying for white to deal with. Uh, so probably bishop takes c4 is a bit more natural. And now simply a6. And if white wants to take this pawn, white can take this pawn. We're not really concerned about it. Uh, we like moves like queen c7. And already we can start eyeing the h2 pawn to regain our lost pawn. Um, so queen takes c5, of course, not the main move. Uh, bishop f4 is the main move. Uh, against bishop h4, you can play a move like knight g6. And it's largely the same, except you don't lose a tempo on your knight. So that's why bishop f4 is much more common. Now knight g6, uh, bishop g3 would transpose, but the slightly more testing line is bishop takes c4, knight takes f4, queen takes f4. Now we do expand with g5 anyways, queen d2, and bishop g7. And after knight g e2, and bishop d7, 
we are finally getting our pieces totally developed. Black is just going to Castle King's side, and all of his pieces will have squares despite this strong d5 pawn. You can expect moves like a6 and uh, b5 to follow. So just lastly, if... Uh, this bishop does end up on g3, then of course you can't really play this line with g5. Uh, in this case, you simply just bring this pawn out to e6, and against d6, you do have to know your stuff. This move knight e7 is, is the key point. Um, kind of the, the problem for uh, black uh, against this bishop g3 line, uh, or against any of these lines, is getting this dark squared bishop developed when this pawn is so far advanced. So once again, against stuff like bishop f4, we simply want to take this bishop, play g5, and develop this way. But if black doesn't allow us, if black plays the move bishop g3 in response, well then that's when we kind of fall back on this e6 idea. We gained some time on this bishop, so now we can play e6. d6 looks scary, but knight e7 is in fact solving our problems. Just to show you a possible continuation, if rook d1, well, now knight f5 is hitting all three of these pieces. This queen can come to c5, but now simply bishop d7. And black is really not going to have any problems in uh, this variation as well. Uh, there's nothing white can really do to hold on to this pawn for dear life. For example, if simply like bishop e2, you're going to be met with rook c8. And already this queen kind of has to leave the defense of this pawn. Uh, you can't really stubbornly stay on it or else you get met with things like a5. And whoops, uh, I trapped your queen. So that's kind of the point of this variation. You just find some way to get this bishop developed. And that is really the three, I'm going to call it, three main lines of the exchange Karo Khan that you absolutely have to know. Uh, just to do some quick review here. Um, the first line we went over today is the exchange with bishop d3. And against bishop d3, uh, the problem black has is how do you develop the light squared bishop? And we solve this problem by playing um, knight c6. Sorry, my study got a little bit messed up here. Knight f6, threatening to come to g4. And if white stubbornly stops us, we play g6 and get this bishop out to f5. So these are the things to keep in mind in this line. You want at all costs to develop this bishop. Now in the second game we looked at, this was of course the end game line. Uh, and wow, my study really got messed up. Okay. The end game line. And this is a very forcing variation where uh, black goes into this end game line, but uh, he shouldn't have any problems. Once again, the key things to remember, bring this king to e6, bring this bishop to b4, bring this rook into an active square, and then uh, black is going to be totally fine in this endgame. And then, once again, if you want to avoid this line, I'm going to recommend a couple things. Uh, the main line used to avoid this is to actually play g6 here, but against uh, this variation in particular, you can also kind of fall back and just play e6 and not develop this bishop. And you're going to end up in an IQP type of position. If you like IQP positions, this one is perfectly fine for black, but I really do prefer bringing this bishop out to, uh, to g4. So those are kind of your two options if you absolutely hate the endgame line and want to avoid it. Although, I do think that uh, black is, is perfectly fine in the endgame line. And then lastly, we took a look at this scary, scary Panov uh, attack where this bishop comes out to g5 and starts putting some pressure on your pieces. All right, I am going to open it up to any questions on this variation, uh, the exchange variation. Uh, I see one from Brian Clark, and so yeah, we'll just do some questions for a couple minutes and then call it here. Um, by the way, if you guys are interested, I will be doing a Twitch class after this uh, called Tactics Time, where I go over some tactics for you. Um, so the end game variation was what I was just asked about. Uh, is the queen trade the only way to go for white? Uh, the answer is, is honestly yes. Uh, if you play queen b3, you're going for this uh, queen trade uh, almost always. Uh, I think there are... Uh, one or two games in lines where uh, black or white chose not to trade. For example, after queen d7, you could play a move like queen c5 check, 
uh, although actually no you can't, that's a different line I'm thinking takes takes. Now here you can play a move like queen b3, or a move like queen e2 check, but the, the fact is black's queen is, is just going to be better than yours. We're going to play f6 and king f7, and this queen is doing an excellent defensive job here for black, and the white queen is going to get kicked around just a little bit. This is not a bad way of playing, but uh, I do think that uh, it's more beneficial to black to, to have these queens on the board. Um, other than that, if you don't want to go for this line at all with white, you can play bishop e2 here, but now black really just has a good version of the IQP, where uh, black's bishop ended up getting developed. Mm -mm. Okay. Is it okay for you to put these lines into chess pools for your own practice? Yes, please do. Please do. Um, and on that note, uh, a lot of these lines are the same lines that uh, Lars Schandorf actually recommends in his book, The uh, Grandmaster Repertoire for the Karo Khan. If you guys want a kind of complete book on learning the Karo, I would definitely recommend that one. It's definitely a long one, and it can be a bit dry at times, but as chess, ta chess content goes, it's, it's one of the best, to be sure. Uh, and that's actually where I learned most of my lines for the Karo, although I did change around quite a few that I, I wasn't quite happy with. Um, but yeah, I mean, feel, feel free. The, the point of this lecture is, is for you to learn the Karo, so do what you need to do to learn it. Uh, okay, other than that, I think I'm going to call it here. Uh, thank you very much for joining me this week on Chess Openings Explained. Uh, if you're watching live, feel free to stick around to head over to our Twitch channel for Tactics Time. If you're watching the video, uh, this is where it ends. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Caleb Demby, and I will see you next week.